So if you would, take your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 1, Exodus chapter 1. It is interesting how sometimes God lays certain passages upon your heart as you're preparing, working on preparing a message, and sometimes it's more difficult than other times. The New Testament is one of my favorites to preach from because there's a lot of quick, easy application that you can just get in and dive into. But studying Exodus, I quickly found some of the challenges as my own resources and commentaries were very limited. Uh, Pastor Mark offered me some resources from his library, but he found out that also his commentaries on Exodus were limited as well. So it's not necessarily a book like Romans, where there just seems to be book after book after book written on Romans and information gathered. But that does not mean that in any way the Old Testament is inferior to the rest of the Bible. There are still great lessons to be learned and great application to be made. So before we get into the text tonight, let me go ahead and set the scene of where we are. First, we have to consider the book of Genesis, and I think... Um, I I'd hope all of us are very familiar with the book of Genesis because there's lots of great historical record and details from the creation and origin of man where we come from to the formation of the Hebrew people through Abraham and especially uh, the story that comes before Exodus here, the story of Joseph. And it's this amazing narrative where you witness a Hebrew young man get sold into slavery to a foreign land, and he suffers trials and afflictions, but he, his faith in God remains strong, and he keeps himself pure. And God is able to use him, not just to preserve his own people, but to preserve many of the nations of the Near East at that time including Egypt, the superpower of that day. And Genesis ends on that great high note. You almost want to cut and roll credits because it's such a great story about how God takes this faithful young man from the lowest of the low positions, builds him up, um, preserves Israel, and we can all call it a happy day and go home. But then we get to Exodus. And Exodus, from the very first verses, the tone begins to change. And the once bright optimism fades just a little bit into maybe some gloomy pessimism. But tonight I want to look at the three people we can see in this text and look at the lessons that we can gain from them today. Uh, If you're taking notes, uh, the three people that I want to look at in this passage is the Pharaoh's forgetfulness, Israel's fruitfulness, and the midwives' faithfulness. But let's go ahead and begin looking at chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Now these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob. Uh, Excuse me. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. And Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and that, and all that generation, and the children of Israel, um, and the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now, there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph, and he said unto his people. Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. 
Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities of Python and Ramses. Now before I go on, I do want to look at our first point tonight. The forgetfulness of the Pharaoh. Or the, the Pharaoh and his forgetfulness. It works both ways. <laughs> so the scene is set for us. Exodus reminds us of how Jacob and his family um, fled their home country to come to Egypt during time of famine. And God used Egypt to preserve uh, his nation, the Hebrew nation. <clears throat> and we come to this, like I mentioned before, this a little bit of pessimism where we see Joseph, his brothers, and all that generation have since passed away. But with this cycle of dying also comes the cycle of birth. And the Hebrews began to multiply and grow mighty, so mighty that the Pharaoh himself noticed this. And it caused him to fear. But part of the reason of his fear is the scripture tells us that a Pharaoh came who knew not Joseph. And I was wondering to myself, how could that be? If you're familiar with Joseph, we, like we mentioned before, God used him to not only save the Hebrews, but to save Egypt, to save many of the nations around them. He was the one who interpreted the dreams of the Pharaoh he was under and um, God showed him that there would be seven years of plenty that he could use as a time to store up grain and food and resources for the seven years of famine immediately after. So, to say in fewer words, Joseph was an important guy. Not just in the Hebrews' history, but even the Egyptians' history. So, I had to think, how could this be? And I wondered if part of it was because of Joseph's nationality. You see, with the ancient Egyptians, when they wrote their records, they were a little prejudiced, racist a little bit even. So much so that when they spoke of themselves, they referred to themselves as the humans and the other groups of people, tent dwellers, foot walkers. Um, and so on. So even finding some reference to different foreigners in the land of Egypt can prove somewhat difficult, especially uh, one of the major issues of contention between historians and biblical scholars was were there Hebrew slaves in Egypt because they didn't really write about it. It wasn't until um, a few, uh, few years later after much more research had been done that they discovered a manifest that included Semitic names uh, for the um, slaves with Semitic names. So we know that they were there. But it could have been that because of Joseph's foreign nationality, that he was a Hebrew, he was lost to the annals of history. He was lost and forgotten. And Egypt continued on, forgetting the man who had brought them such prosperity and preserve them. But even though I do not explicitly say I cannot think in the mind of Pharaoh, it, I wonder if also it could have been one of those intentional oversights that he noticed the strength of the Hebrew people and he set aside his memory of Joseph. He set aside the memory of how they came there in the stead of political expedience. And we see that. It says... The scripture tells us he chooses to deal with them wisely. He's choosing worldly wisdom now to deal with these people in his land that aren't Egyptians. And I would say his concern 
that because they've grown so mighty that they might join an opposing invading force is not too far out of the realm. Now, I'm not sure if the Hebrews themselves would have done it, but in the Egyptian mind, the Hebrews were Semitic. They're from the promised land where the Canaanites are, and the Canaanites were very much an enemy of Egypt. So it's not too far outside maybe the realm of possibilities that should the Canaanites come down, maybe there'd be some commonality between them and the Hebrews that they would take the opportunity and wipe out Egypt. So Pharaoh chooses the worldly wisdom, and he sets up taskmasters to afflict them with the purpose of discouraging their growth and to keep them from growing too large. And the secondary purpose, of course, to build stuff, to build the cities of Python and Ramses. And if you've seen Egyptian ruins, they are quite magnificent. And just to look at some of these buildings, even when you realize the pyramids themselves, were built probably with simple machines and hand tools. Um, as far as we know, inclined planes, levers, and everything. This pharaoh was using the uh, growing number of Hebrews to build um, treasure cities and much for him. Now, looking at this example of the pharaoh, um, I kind of drew two conclusions, two types of pharaohs that I've seen. And I think the first is the pharaoh in us, or maybe rather how we act, can act like this pharaoh. Because he chooses worldly wisdom, he chooses political expediency over um, caring for God's people. So I don't know whether he forgot intentionally, like that does happen, or if the story of Joseph, the reason why the Hebrews were there, their history was lost and did not matter, was of no consequence to the Egyptians. Now this was convicting to me because I began to think how many times do I choose pragmatism or expediency over what the truth of God is. And I think the easiest one is, it's probably no secret, I'm a little shy and um, not as much as an introvert, in, or not as much as an extrovert as maybe I see him up here. I'm a little bit of an introvert. And I know God has called us to go out and share the gospel and witness and build relationships and lead people that they might know Jesus. But sometimes... The pragmatic thing is to keep my mouth shut. There used to be this term, too. Um, have you ever heard the term undercover Christian sometimes? Um, and some, especially now, you can suffer ridicule, which is honestly nothing compared to what other Christians in the world are going through. Ridicule for coming out and having a conservative or Christian viewpoint. And I found myself choosing the pragmatic thing, which was to keep my mouth shut, maybe even identify with some of the behavior or speech that some people were using. I think possibly the easiest one to get caught up in is often gossiping. That's kind of an easy thing. And I think all of us would say we know that is wrong. We know uh, Scripture tells us time after time, you read in James and how he talks about the tongue is a little member to be controlled, you know, out of it comes life and death. Um, Philippians remind us, let no corrupt thing proceed out of thy mouth. And we know these scriptural truths, but sometimes we forget them. We put them in the back of our mind. We overlook them. We do not go back to them as often as we sometimes should. And because of that, we choose what's pragmatic, what is best for us in our own eyes. So to combat this, of course, we need to revisit those. Think of how the text would have been different if maybe Pharaoh kept up on his history and maybe found this obscure character named Joseph 
and asked, hmm, I wonder who this Joseph fellow is, where he came from, and then saw the connection between Joseph and the Hebrew people, do you think the narrative would be different? Of course it would be. So I'm encouraging you today, revisit the truths of Scripture often. Keep them in your mind often, lest we forget and choose our own way over God's way. Now, the second is maybe a little bit lesser uh, of a comparison. The second pharaoh I saw is our own political establishment. Now, granted, I am treading lightly. I'm not trying to get too political. Um, And I mean no slight against the president of the United States, drawing the comparison between pharaoh. But much less to say that the status quo in the United States has changed. Just like the status, well, maybe not exactly like, but the status quo in Egypt changed for the Israelites. They went from living peaceful lives to now being pushed under hard labor. And I'm thankful we don't have to experience that now. But because of this change of status quo, we can be tempted to revile our leaders. God placed Pharaoh on the throne. That Pharaoh who afflicted his people on the throne just as he placed Joe Biden as the president of the United States. And unfortunately, maybe another similarity I strike or I saw that struck me was how even this political regime how it aligns itself with policies that quite honestly are under satanic influence from the transgender issue, to abortion, to so many other things that are hindering the growth of the church, attacking the church, attacking reality itself, attacking the the family structure as God had designed it. And both those leaders choose political expediency at the cost of Um, to the detriment of the people of Israel, to the detriment of the church. But that does bring me to my next point, because the story doesn't end there. We saw the forgetfulness of the Pharaoh. But now let's look at the Israelites' fruitfulness, the Israelites' fruitfulness. Let's go ahead and look down at Exodus, starting in verse 5. I put a typo in there. Sorry about that. Let's go ahead and look at verses 12 through 14. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved uh, because the children of Israel and the Egyptians made their children, made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. So we see that not just are they drafted into slavery, they multiplied again. The opposite effect of what Pharaoh had thought would happen happened. They grew even stronger, so they put more hard labor on them. They added more tasks, again, hoping that this would go ahead and quash and keep down the growing Hebrew nation within Egypt's borders. But I want to take a step back and look at how God used Egypt for Israel. Because how did Egypt, or how we know Israel went there, and we already talked about how God used Egypt to preserve Israel. But did you know when Joseph came to Pharaoh asking for some land for his family to stay, Pharaoh told him that uh, they would give him or give his family the best. We see that in Genesis forty-five five. I have it here. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land, make thy father and thy brethren dwell. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, make, then make them rulers over my cattle. So 
that Pharaoh that Joseph was under allowed Joseph to choose the best of the land, and that was the land of Goshen. Goshen is in the, if you're looking at a map, it is in the southeastern portion of the Nile Delta. And it is a very um, critical spot there, well, the whole Nile Delta, because if you look at a satellite image of Egypt today even, it's this interesting picture where you see this green kind of triangle go down into the green Nile River with desert on either side. The Nile is very much the lifeblood of that region. And here, the land of Goshen was great grazing area for the cattle and the sheep that the Hebrews brought with them. So God used Egypt to preserve them, but God also used Egypt to grow Israel into a nation. And as we read in scripture, they multiplied even in their affliction. And the other thing that maybe goes unnoticed is they remained distinctly Hebrew. And I want to make this a point because it's something we can gloss over. Would Pharaoh would have felt threatened if the Hebrews adopted the Egyptian way of life, the Egyptian culture. They may have been treated like second-class citizens because, as we mentioned before, they were foreigners. But if they had assimilated more into the Egyptian culture, maybe we wouldn't have be, Maybe the text wouldn't read this way at all. And I'm not suggesting that that's a good thing because then the Hebrew nation grows to be lost. It could be lost within another country. And with that, who knows how that would have affected the whole redemption story. They remain distinctly Hebrew. And I can't help but wonder if part of the reason why they multiplied in their affliction, why they remained distinctly Hebrew, was because in their mind they held the Abrahamic covenant. And that was the covenant that God made with Abraham, telling him, that he would make him a blessing even unto all nations. That he would bless those that bless thee, curse those that curse thee. He promised Abraham the promised land. As well as that he would be the father of a great nation. And I believe this was echoing in the Israelites' head as they were living in Egypt. And I know this to be true because before Joseph died, did you know, before he died, he gave the command that they should take his bones out of the land of Egypt with him. That was present in their minds that they would one day go home. And Joseph does also mention in that, when God visit you. Because I think the other thing was tempted to think, why is, Egypt, why is Israel still in Egypt? It's a pagan land with gross pagan idolatry at that time. Why are they still there? Well, they were waiting on God to visit them. And even... Many, many years before, God prophesied to Abraham, telling him that his seed would be in a strange, strangers in a strange land for 400 years. Part of the reason? Because God would use Egypt to grow Israel into a nation. And in their faithfulness, they would keep the commandment to be fruitful and multiply. They would hold that promise in their mind that they would be a great nation, a nation to bless the whole world. And they were faithful in that way. The last thing in this point I want to look at is that God used Egypt to prepare Israel for their journey ahead. Now with this Egyptian slavery, it was harsh. It was hard labor. But as I read up on it more, it was interesting that I think often in our heads we picture them making bricks all day and moving bricks and all bricks, bricks, bricks. We get caught on that. But it does tell us that they had other jobs as well as working in the field. And with ancient Egyptian slavery at this time, basically, if you were a taskmaster, you could have a slave do whatever you didn't really want to do. I just have children for that now. No, I'm kidding. Um, but a taskmaster, if they noticed maybe you had some promise and say, hey, I don't want you making bricks anymore. I want you to go learn stonemasonry and put you in stonemasonry. Or I want you to build scaffolding. Or I want you to uh, tend the, the farm animals. Or I want you to do this. We know that 
the Hebrew people, their occupation coming into Israel was mostly herdsmen and shepherds. But here, God could use this affliction of slavery to give his people more skills, more skills that they would take with them as they go to establish their own nation. And you, one of the great examples I can think of is Bezalel, the great carpenter that God gives the instructions of the tabernacle to. And think how in the wilderness they crafted things like the tabernacle, the great um, wooden beams that were involved, or even the Ark of the Covenant. God was using this time to prepare Israel for the journey ahead. And also, I'm sure there was an aspect of toughening them up as well because wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, they didn't know that that would happen at the time. But God knew full well that they would make them rough and make them robust, that they would be able to survive through that as well. So by way of application... um, It is interesting to me that God would use Egypt, like I mentioned, a land steeped in mysticism and paganism and polytheism in those days. Yeah, Egypt is used to spare, grow, and prepare Israel for the road of head. But like I mentioned, I'm sure the temptation to assimilate and to enjoy the comfort of sin for a season is another good scriptural reference. They could have stayed there, and that could have been the end of the story and changed. God would have changed his plan some other way, I'm sure. But Israel remained faithful and obedient and holding the promise, uh, promises of God in their head so that when God visited them, chose to visit him, visit them in Israel, they would be prepared and ready to go. So for us, think of how often God used, sometimes uses peculiar instruments to sharpen us and prepare us for the road ahead. I found this interesting. Do you know the country where Christianity is growing the fastest per capita? Iran. A place that is an Islamic dictatorship. And there's riots going on now and they're struggling with that, but a place that has a morality police that would beat you for the smallest infraction against Islam. That is where Christianity is growing the fastest per capita. And it astounds me that, again, like I mentioned before, even I struggle to bring the gospel in a nation where my viewpoint is protected, my speech is protected, my worship is protected. And I struggle with that. It's a very convicting sermon, even for me, as I I prepare that. And even one of the other things is we look at how terrible the world is sometimes, and we think, I've heard this repeated often and often by Christian young people today, the prospect of marriage is daunting to them. And even I've heard someone equate having children and raising children selfish because how could you raise children in such a wicked world? Because God calls us to be faithful. And part of that faithfulness is leaving behind another godly generation. He wants us to be fruitful and multiple. Part of that, uh, multiply. Part of that faithfulness is to go out and witness to the world and multiply the church under the limited affliction that we see today in our own country. And I pray. There are are even Christians who pray that more persecution comes here, that it would make us strong, even like the affliction made the Israelites stronger. But I pray that we would not have to wait for great affliction to befall us, for us to multiply in the faith. Be like the Israelites and stay rooted in God's promises. And let the trials around you shape you into Christ's likeness. Now, the last person that I want to, or the last people I want to look at in the passage, and I'll go ahead and pick up the pace here, is the midwives' faithfulness. The midwives' faithfulness. We're starting in verse 15 through 21. And the king of Egypt spake 
to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, when ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then, they, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Israel, or king of Egypt, called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwife said unto him, Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt with the midwives, and the people dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that, they, that he made them houses." So the last thing is the faithfulness of the midwives. And we saw Pharaoh's command that if they should deliver a baby Hebrew boy, they were to kill that Hebrew boy. This, again, is the Pharaoh choosing political expediency over the welfare of God's people. And by virtue... He is letting himself and his decisions be manipulated by Satan. Satan is using this as an opportunity to try and cut off the line of the Messiah. I know most often we think of how Herod tried to kill all the baby boys in Bethlehem, but this happened many years before in Egypt. They tried, though, but thankfully to some faithful midwives, they failed. I can't help but wonder. Now, granted, they did not have scripture written down like we had. And I'm sure certain promises were passed down in oral tradition. I couldn't help but wonder if in the back of the mind of those midwives, they were thinking Genesis 3.15, the promise of a coming Messiah. And that caused them to not just protect life because life is sacred and in the likeness and image of God, but also because they knew the possibility possibility of the coming Messiah that they might even see him because they didn't know he would be born in Bethlehem that hadn't been written yet they didn't know that he'd be born many 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 years later they were operating on the promise that God had given them in their time and we see these midwives obey God rather than man and they do have an interesting response to Pharaoh. I can't condone lying. I don't think lying is right. So this is a, one of those little tricky minefields to navigate. Um, but I wonder if maybe they, because I know it's kind of funny in the text, but basically what they're saying there is, uh, hey, these Hebrew women, they're, um, they're lively. They're having the babies before we even get there. And, you know, the, when we get there, baby's gone. So, so I don't know if... They were straight up lying, or if they were just taking their time going to the houses uh, to save these baby boys alive. But like I said, even though I cannot condone lying, I don't think lying is right. I think that's a, a scriptural principle. The actions of the midwives was correct to protect and save human life as well as the little Hebrew boys. Unless they were given the blessing of God, we see that God deals well with the midwives and then eventually gives them houses, families of their own. So by way of application, these Hebrew midwives are a great example of faithfulness to us because we have this beautiful contrast here. We have a wicked Pharaoh letting himself uh, be manipulated by Satan so much so that his actions are satanic to cut off the line of the Messiah to kill these Hebrew baby boys for his own political expediency. Contrast that with the faithfulness of these midwives who chose to obey God 
rather than satanic influence, rather than man. And they're actually brought about to work a great plan that was bigger than themselves because we see Israel multiplied yet again into more numbers. I think historians equated you know, several million people, at least two million people now by this point. God used them to preserve the Hebrew nation and by proxy preserve the line of the Messiah as, they would, as the Israelites would come out of Egypt. Likewise, you can choose between worldly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. And they both experience different outcomes. Choosing worldly wisdom can lead to satanic influence. And I'm not pulling punches because right now, more than ever, I'm sure you can look outside at the world and truly see that if it's not for God, it's against God. And Satan is against God. There is no gray area, and especially now today. It's either heavenly wisdom choosing to follow God or worldly wisdom choosing to follow Satan. And we have a whole example of the Bible of great Christian men, human men and women who followed God, who chose to follow God or be obedient to God. And all of them were used in plans much greater than themselves, from Noah to Joseph to Moses, to Joshua, to Rahab, to Ruth, and Mary, and so on. And the list continues. Each one of them, they were human. They stumbled. But they chose to obey God, even when everyone else may have told them not to, told them to follow their authorities, Because God was actually their true authority, and that's who they chose to follow. And nowadays, I'm not, again, this is not a a, a sermon focusing on this civil disobedience aspect, but there is a time when even in our highest office they are telling us things, uh, like I mentioned before, that are satanic, and they want us to comply, to go along with it, to allow it. But it is better to obey God than man. It is better to share the truth of what the Bible actually says, despite the ridicule that you might face. And sadly, I did think of an illustration, if you remember the name Joshua Harris, who was a Christian man who wrote several books, and I had read some of these books. And some of them had good advice that I would carry with me. And the content in some of his books is still good. But if you do not know, he came out and denounced Christianity and left Christianity. And he also endorsed the LGBT community. An ideology that is based in the destruction and the perversion of the family as God meant it to be. Because he did this, I'm sure, I know I felt betrayed. Because he did this, I'm sure there were Christians out there who were confused. Because here's a man who lifted, who was kind of an authority, especially in the realm of marriage and dating and sexual purity, now flip-flopping his stance. So I can't imagine that choosing this worldly wisdom did suffer some consequences. Confused young people, left them thinking, what, what is true? And I ask you not to be like that. Be like the example of Joseph, who, despite being sold into slavery, despite being accused falsely, he chose to obey God rather than man. And God used him to preserve his nation. And it all begins with simple obedience. Simple obedience and faithfulness. So as I conclude tonight I hope that this is an encouragement it's not easy to read portions of the Old Testament and Exodus 1 is often a chapter we can skim over quickly because we want to get to Moses right that's a great story in itself but there's still lessons to be gleaned and I hope I have encouraged inspired you the next time that you go through Exodus that you look for those lessons that you might glean information that especially as we go forward in this week, we're, don't, we're tempted, 
that we choose not to fall into temptation like Pharaoh and choose our own expediency, our own benefit over God and his truth, that we can be fruitful like the Israelites, that despite the affliction that we face upon us, that we continue in the promises that God has given us, that we hold those promises in our heart. They were waiting on God to lead them out of Israel. Church, we today are waiting on Jesus to rapture the church. And lastly, to be faithful like the midwives, who despite being told by the highest authority of the day to kill baby Hebrew boys, they chose to obey God, who is the highest authority over all kings and principalities. And that you might even receive blessing, that you might even be used by God in a plan so much greater than you could ever imagine. So, as we read the Old Testament, look for these lessons. Because you might find them in some places you might not be expecting to see. Thank you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today and thank you for this opportunity to come and preach your word uh, before Faith Baptist Church, Lord. And I thank you for this internship and what a blessing it has been to me. And I pray that uh, I might have been a blessing to the church and made much of your son, Jesus. I pray that as we go forward in our week that you hold these examples in our memory that we remember to choose you over our own benefit, that we remember to stay rooted and grounded in your word and your promises and remember to be faithful despite whatever the culture around us is doing. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Mark. Let's stand together, would you, church? I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that message tonight because uh, that closing application of not choosing to not choosing to take what's what's most convenient. That, that was a good observation that Pharaoh Pharaoh may have forgotten all about Joseph just because it was convenient for him to do so. And sometimes what is convenient for you and me to do, whether it's at home, especially at work, but out among lost folks, what's convenient is not always right. And then to, to be fruitful. I, you want to be fruitful where God puts you, even if it's in a hard place. Uh, for the children of Israel to grow and to multiply and strengthen like they did while being enslaved and intensified, uh, intensified in their persecution. And then just to be faithful like those midwives um, and do what God gives you to do. Let's bow our heads for just a few minutes as, as Angie begins to play. And I, I don't know what God may do in your heart tonight. But examine, examine what God would do with this sermon with you. Your, your fruitfulness, regardless of the hardship that you're in, that your family's in, your fruitfulness and your faithfulness, choosing to obey God rather than men. Our country may come to that sooner than we think. Are we, are we willing to do that? Thank you. You can look up this way. Josh, thanks for that message tonight. I appreciate I appreciated that. And um, I want you to be in prayer for Josh and Amy, just like they've requested us to. This is an exciting time for them. Um, I know what it is to be called to a church and then have to wait. And if he's got to wait till December or January, they're going to be chomping at the bits to get down there and get going. Um, and so be in prayer for them. And when you see uh, when you see the Cortez family, let them know you're praying for them. Pray about this housing situation. Isn't that just like God?
uh, to after they leave. I, I so appreciate that. Josh was telling me this. Two days after they leave, this door opens up. And I don't know. I told Josh this week. I said, I don't know if that's where God's going to have you live or not. But I do, I do think it's showing God is at work. And if he's leading you to Ruskin, Florida, there's a house or an apartment or something down there for you guys to shelter in. He's not going to have you living in an equinox. God just doesn't work like that. Um, so I'm excited for Josh and Amy and church. You should be too, um, as God has opened this door of ministry for them at this, uh, at this, in this youth pastor position. Many of you know Brother, Brother Barry Rumsey. He's preached in our pulpit a number of times. He was dear friends with Pastor David Cross, and he and his wife have grown to be good friends with Terry and I. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what God does with Josh and Amy down there, and I really would like you to be praying for them. Pray for them during this waiting time. Pray that God would prepare the hearts of teenagers down there. He's going to have not only opportunity in the church, but also they've got a large Christian school. Josh will have influence uh, in the lives of those young people at the school regarding chapels and uh, opportunities to instruct there. And uh, and I'm just I'm just thankful God's opened this door for them. So let's pray for them. All right. I hope you have a good week church, and uh, hopefully you'll remember to pray for those in our church family uh, who might be struggling, those who will be traveling, and we'll look forward to being back together on Wednesday night. Come and join us tomorrow night if you can, weather permitting. Uh, we'll, have this, uh, we'll have this opportunity to have an outreach in our community, and I hope that works out, all right? Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for your word. Old Testament or New Testament, we open it up and find all scripture has been inspired by your Holy Spirit, and it's profitable to us. And this certainly is tonight, to look at what you did in the children of Israel, even when they were suffering like they were and facing uh, an opposing government to everything they were about. Lord, you grew them and you strengthened them, and we pray that you would do that for us, that you would grow us as believers in Christ and teach us how to be better Christians and brighter lights in this world as we draw closer and closer to the coming of Jesus Christ. Bless our church family as we go out this week and we have interaction uh, tomorrow night, Lord willing, with all these families here, but also, God, with people that we'll see and we rub shoulders with regularly. Help us to look for those divine appointments that you bring our way so that we can share Christ with the lost and we can be an encouragement uh, to brothers and sisters in Christ who may need lifting up. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.